Amen. As you know, we, we got a, this is the end of August. Next month is going to be a powerful month. Got a lot of things going on. We got a special service Tuesday, Wednesday night with Eddie B. will be with us. He is an uh, evangelist, mainly. He, he's really into a lot of prisons, two, three hundred prisons services a year. So uh, out of Albuquerque, he'll be with us. And of course, next week, if you've got babies to dedicate, please let us know. The week after that, if you want to be baptized, please let us know. We're moving toward Muscle Car Sunday. Amen. On the 27th, after that, we got our conference. Amen. 17 years as a church. Can we give God praise for that? Amen. Good stuff. We've been preaching on overcoming. I've been reading your testimonies, and we'll encourage you to keep testifying on social media. There needs to be something uplifting on social media than what we're hearing and seeing. So please put something out there to let people know that you are victorious in Christ, that God has done great things in your life. Amen. It's not hard to testify. We've shared about that the last few weeks. But one of the reasons why people won't testify is they are intimidated. They feel intimidated. So today I want to talk to you about overcoming intimidation. Amen. In order to do that it's important to understand the word of God are you comfortable second Corinthians chapter 4 verse 7 second Corinthians chapter 4 verse 7 you know I found it's the uh, the unction of God the anointing of God amen God on flesh doing those things that flesh cannot do that changes us affects us gives us the ability to speak into a world of chaos second Corinthians 4 7 says well you have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. This is one of my favorite scriptures because it tells me that even though we are fragile, even though these bodies of ours break down, that there is Christ in you, the hope of glory, there's power in you, and it doesn't come from you, but it comes from God. I believe everybody can be a superhero with God inside you. Can I get an amen? It causes hell to shudder, amen, but as we're finding out, there's more to the anointing just than just one thing. Confidence comes from that. When you have the anointing, and when I say anointing, a lot of people think that's just a preacher thing. No, that's a people thing. When God anoints you, uh, the scripture says Jesus anoint, uh, God anointed Jesus to go around and heal the sick and to do good. It, it, heaven has to touch you. You got to get a touch from heaven in order to do the things God's called you to do. So you're asking God all the time, God, touch me, help me, anoint me to do those things which you are calling me to do right now. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for our guest. I ask your blessing upon this house. In Jesus' name, and everyone shout. Amen. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. When I already got my bandana off, you know I'm fitting to wrap this thing up. Amen, if it's all ready to go. That's usually about mid-service where that bandana comes off, and I'm already ready to get after this. Where, where, does, where does this uh, uh, anointing come from? Where does this thing that helps me overcome intimidation? It's the word is confidence. Everybody say confidence. You know, David, we talked about King David last week. We're going to talk about David again today. David was found favored and approved by God. Psalm 89, 20, the scripture says, I have found David, my servant, and my, with my sacred oil, I have anointed him. That Psalms is telling us that when Samuel did, when he found David as a young boy, 15, 16 years old, and anointed him, that oil was just more than something liquid poured on his head. It was a touch from heaven, an approval from heaven, an unction from heaven, an anointing from heaven to help David do the things that God was going to call him to do. Now, let me mention to you, David never had one physical miracle in all of his ministry and life. And that blows a lot of people away because, you know, Abraham saw miracles. Moses saw miracles. Uh, we know that the disciples of the New Testament saw miracles. But here is David, a man after God's own heart, who never saw a physical miracle. And it hit you say, well, he took down Goliath. That was skill, my friend. That was the unction of God on his life and skill that did that. God's servant first has to be spiritual. When I say the word spiritual, I'm not talking about super spiritual. I'm saying understanding the supernatural. Second Chronicles 16, 9 says, For the eyes of the Lord range throughout the earth to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. When you got a heart toward God, God said, I'm going to strengthen you. I'm going to help you do what you never thought you were able to do. It's important to understand that true spirituality is simply you grieve over wrong. You're concerned over those things that displease God. You long to please Him with your actions, and you care about the motivations behind your actions. You know, your motivation is so important. The reason why you do what you do. Yesterday, David and I talked about a simple scripture. It says, let your works be seen before men that they may glorify your Father in heaven. Remember that? But there's another scripture that says, don't let your right hand know what your left hand's doing. And that the Pharisees often showed what they did in order to be seen of man. So it looks like it's contradictory. The issue is the motivation and the attitude behind what you do. 
When you bless people because you got a right attitude and there's humility in your life, and this is what was true with David, he had humility. God had David on surveillance. You ever felt like God was surveilling you? You ever felt like you were being watched? Oh, you ever thought that? You had that something out there. Watch me. I tell you who is. God's watching you. Amen. He's got you under surveillance. He's looking after you. He saw him with his sheep. He saw him with a servant's heart. Psalm 78, 70 said he chose David, his servant, and took him from the sheep pens. He saw him. He observed him. A servant is humble, not rebellious. Respecting those in charge, serving faithfully and quietly. If I use the word servant, I could also use the word an employee. Is humble, not rebellious, respecting those in charge, serving faithfully and quietly. A servant doesn't care who gets the glory. Their main goal is to make sure that the one they serve look better. Amen. They don't want the, the one they serve to fail. They're after them. The third thing David had was integrity. The word integrity in the Hebrew language means complete, whole, innocent, having simplicity of life, wholesome, sound, unimpaired, to the bone honesty. Psalm 78, 71 says, From tending the sheep, God brought him to be the shepherd of his people, Jacob of Israel, his inheritance. And David shepherded them with integrity of heart and skillfulness of hands. Amen. As a warrior with his hands, but also with a heart after God. You know, many of God's people, his servants like David, they grew up in obscurity. They're unknown, unseen, unappreciated, and unapplauded, and never on social media. You know, one of the things that I, 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 I wrestle is, do we want to put everything out there on social media? Let me answer that for you. No. There are things you ought to do for God that never show up on Facebook or Instagram or anything else. Amen. You just do it. Some people will look at that and think, well, you ain't doing nothing because you ain't posting your stuff. I don't want you to know all my stuff. Amen. I want to make sure God sees you because I'm under surveillance. Amen. He's watching my life. And I can tell you that many of the people of the little country church have been unknown, unseen, unappreciated, and at times unapplauded. And I want to thank you for all that you do. If you can handle the silence of solitude, you may be qualified for the applause of popularity. Many times people want to be popular, but they don't understand that David went through very quiet times of his life, dealing with lions and bears and taking care of the sheep. Remember, the, con the conversion of a soul is the miracle of the moment. The making of a saint is a task of a lifetime. You can give your life to Jesus. Jesus today, but it's going to take a lifetime to get you right. Amen. To get your mind right, get your spirit right, to deal with attitudes and wrong attitudes. You know, just because you got born again doesn't mean your character changed immediately. Amen. It takes a little sanctification to work in your life. So the first anointing David received was for going. You know, we too have been commanded to go, therefore, and to teach. We're hindered, though, by intimidation. We feel intimidated. To make timid, to feel with fear, to... to uh, to be uh, coerced or inhibit or by, by threats. you got to break intimidation. As a young man coming up, my education was not good. I can be honest with you. I came up during a time of, uh, just like many of you, no computers. We actually had to learn how to write. We had the gazundas. You know what I'm talking about? Two gazundas, six, three times. You know, we had to learn stuff like that. And I didn't feel, and because of your education or your ability to speak or articulate, you can feel intimidated. Uh, you can feel intimidated by, by not stepping out in the world and feeling socially connected with people who are financially greater in life than you are. All these things intimidate. But when you have confidence in God, the day you discover you are His kid, you have the inheritance of God waiting for you. Amen. That what you do here matters there. All of a sudden, you start welling up with Christ in you, and things begin to change in your life. And you, say, you think to yourself, you know what? I don't care how big a Goliath is. I believe in the name of Jesus I can take care of him. Intimidation. 2 Timothy 1.7 says, For God did not give us a spirit of timidity, but a spirit of power, love, and self-discipline, or a sound mind. Boldness comes from the virtues of power, love, and soundness of mind. Boldness, that is fueled by God's character, awakens the gifts in our lives. You know, some people act confident when faced with little or no opposition. It wasn't, you know, when we, we got everything ready for the storm, and, we, and that storm came in, we didn't get a single drop of water, not even a puff of wind. My wife looked at me the next day, and she said, you act disappointed. 
I said, I am a little bit disappointed. You know, I was looking for something to take place. We did all this work to get ready. But then I started hurting from my brothers over to the east. It was a little bit different there. But their strength does not run deep. Some people are just so superficial. Their bold face is a mask for arrogance or ignorance with the roots being shallow. But the next storm exposes them. And I'm going to tell you, storms do expose us. When the weather is good, every tree stands. But when the winds of adversity blow, evidence of deep roots are exposed. You'll, you'll pick up on on fear and lack of faith and all these things when the storms hit. David said in Psalm 27, 1, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? David knew the power of God because he knew God. David was not intimidated. First, David wasn't intimidated by being the youngest. I talked about this last week. He wasn't intimidated by being the littlest fellow out of the bunch. It didn't bother him. Amen. Often he'd been overlooked, but he overcame. Everybody say overcome. David was intimidated by the lack of approval by his own brothers. This thing about his brothers, you know, 1 Samuel 17, 28 said when David showed up at the battle, you know, the big battle between Goliath and the Philistines and the Israelites in 40 days there. When David showed up after 40 days of them squaring off, his brother Eliab, David's oldest brother, heard him speaking with the men. He burned with anger at him and asked, Why have you come down here? And with whom did you leave those few sheep in the desert? I know how conceited you are and how wicked your heart is. You came down only to watch the battle. Now let me tell you something about this. This statement of this older brother was to intimidate David. Was to tell David to go back. Up until then, the brothers could hide their insecurities among the crowd with David's presence. The brothers felt naked. As long as David didn't show up, you know, there's certain people walk into your life and go, "Uh uh-oh. You know, they walk in with boldness. They walk in with... With, with, the, with the integrity and super, uh, they, they, they have an idea about God and the goodness of God and they walk right in the midst of life and all of a sudden it begins to expose you. It brought out in the open air their weakness. They had been silent by mutual agreement based on compromise. Nobody say anything to Goliath. We'll just let him cuss us. We'll just let him cross boundaries. We'll let him make fun of us. We'll do all that. They lashed out at David knowing if they could discredit him, it would cover their shame. The big brother Eliab who was intimidated by Goliath, tried to intimidate his little brother. I sense a a, a, a threat, an intimidation in our world today, trying to silence people, make you be quiet, amen, not say anything. you got to stand for God. you got to stand for what's right, and you got to speak your mind. Can I get an amen? amen? Well, a little bit of your mind. Don't use it all, please. Save some for later. Eliab was now bold, bold with anger. He attacked David's character. Not the problem facing Israel. When a person is intimidated, he looks for escape, a release of pressure. If he is weak, he makes excuses. If he's embarrassed, he will often attack those who have confronted him by putting some form of blame back on them. He accused David of conceit and wickedness. People with strong personalities will use intimidation to make a lie look like the truth. Remember, the Pharisees sought to intimidate Jesus. Amen. Uh, They tried to control him. They said he was a traitor. They called Jesus a drunkard. They called him a demon-possessed sinner, which were the very characteristics of many of the Pharisees that were saying it. David wasn't intimidated at the size of Goliath. According to some accounts, Goliath was ten and a half foot tall. We've never seen a man that tall. An experienced warrior with a bronze helmet, an armor weighing 125 pounds, with a combined weight of armor, spear, and shield weighing over 200 pounds. David was amazed by what he saw, but not the size of Goliath, but the reaction of his countrymen. It wasn't about Goliath screaming out defiance. It was his brother and all of his friends, buck, 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 acting chicken and scared. It bothered David. It affected him. Amen. That's what bothered him the most. David was amazed by that. 1 Samuel 17, 24 when the Israelites saw the man they all ran from him in great fear. Speaking again of Goliath the answer for intimidation is confidence. Everybody say confidence. Confidence is a a powerful thing. Confidence says I've won this fight before. I've been through this before. Confidence will, will, will raise you up among people. Hebrews 10, 35 tells me that I need to have confidence in what God has done in my life and the spiritual things that are taking place. Do not throw away your confidence. It will be richly rewarded. You need to preserve so that when you have done the will of God, you will receive what He has promised. For in just a little while, He who is coming will come and will not delay. 
but my righteous one will live by faith. And if they shrink back, I will not be pleased with him. But we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but of those who believe and are saved. This is during a time of tremendous persecution in the church. Now hear me. I have to be careful what I say because there are people that say, if I say it too strong, I'm being mean toward them. The truth of the matter is, God put faith inside you when you got born again. He put backbone inside of you, and He said for you to stand. After you've done everything to stand in life, you keep standing. Amen. I don't care if it's virus. I don't care if it's riots. I don't care what's going on in the world. You keep on standing. If it's a hurricane coming, you stand for God. If it's financial disruption, you stand for God. If it's persecution, you stand for God. He said, I can't help. I, I, I'm not real fond of you if you shrink back. You ever met anybody with the shrink? I said, you ever met anybody with the shrinks? They shrink back from a fight. They shrink back from that which is right. They begin to pull back. This is no time to shrink. Can I get an amen? Amen. Some folk act like they've been in dishwater way too long. We're not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but of those who believe and are saved. Confidence, my friend, is a plan of slow growth. Confidence is keeping your chin up. Overconfidence, though, is sticking your neck out. Be careful of which one there. The power of confidence is important. Having confidence in the face of intimidation, Hebrews 10, 35. Cast not away, therefore, your confidence, which has a great recompense of reward. Why is it that we don't cast away? Because I got a reward coming. This is what's mind-blowing to me. All, if God just said to me, hey, Jerry, I'm going to give you salvation, and it just means that when you die, you won't go to a devil's hell, but you will go to a Savior's kingdom. That's good enough for me, Frank. But on top of all that, he said, I got a reward for you. Now, I'm not a wealthy man by any means, but I have been able to secure and own a few things in my life. And I can be honest with you, my children look at my stuff as their inheritance. And sometimes the older I get, the more I feel like they being buzzered about it. Y'all know what I'm talking about when I'm talking about buzzer, kind of circling around your stuff. They go over and touch your stuff and say, one day you're going to be mine. Hallelujah. Amen. They touch your guns and your Harley and all your, they just walk around and you think you say, but imagine yourself, the inheritance you've got with God who created the earth that named every star. It ain't that God knows how many stars they are. He named every star. When you see the depth of the galaxy, it will blow your mind. And God said, I've named every one of those stars. I'm going to make you ruler over the kingdom of God. Amen. I got an, a reward and an inheritance for you. Again, I don't understand what all that's going to be, but I want to live in such a way to get everything I can. Can I get an amen? Amen. So the purpose of that threat, a threat is an expression of an intention to inflict evil or damage. Our nation right now is under threat. People are threatening. They're threatening if you don't line up with their policies. They're threatening if you don't do the right thing. About, you know, and, and it's disruptive because I find myself at times uh, a little bit on both sides. I feel for injustice, but I have felt for injustice for all people. Amen. So I have felt, you know, somebody said, well, until you've had a gun in your face, I have had a gun in my face. I have been put in jail. I have felt like I was done wrong. I have been arrested for protesting what I believe was a righteous cause. Amen. So I, I look at life and I say, I, I understand the threats here. Has 2020 made you feel threatened? Anybody felt threatened with 2020? I'm asking you a question. No, I'm sorry. I'm talking to those online right now. <laughs> Amen. Have you felt a little bit threatened about stuff? But it must be because gun sales sure went up. Right. Hey, man, things started taking it off. You know, we feel threatened by racial uh, tension, riots, looting, political upheaval, the pandemic, the China virus, businesses closing, pro sports, churches have been closing. There have been pastors resigning. The economy's tanking, social distancing, mask wearing. There are Goliaths in our day to day that we've never had to face before. That Goliath, the scripture says of him, that Goliath stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel, Why do you come out and line up for the battle? Am I not a Philistine and you are not the servants of Saul? Choose a man you have to come down against me. If he's able to fight and kill me, he will become your subject. We will become your subjects. But if I overcome him and kill him, you will become our subjects and serve us. This is that great battle we speak of so often. When the Philistine said, this day I defy the ranks of Israel, give me a man 
and let us fight each other. On hearing the Philistines' word, Saul and all the Israelites were dismayed and terrified. They felt threat. They felt intimidated. Again, it was a menace that represented a threat to them. Fear and faith have something in common. Both believe that what you cannot see will happen. Let me say it again. Fear and faith have something in common. Both believe that what you cannot see will happen. On Tuesday, Monday and Tuesday, we were gathering for the storm. We were putting things up. We were practicing. Uh, yeah, you know, what are we going to do if the rains come, the winds come? How are we going to move things around? We'd already taken care of 16 buildings on the property and secured the other three of our own. We were preparing for it. But then I had this, this angst, this anxiety about wondering about this storm, and we were seeing the projections of when it would come. And here's where that fear and faith rise up in you. And it, and it wasn't the faith that says, faith says it ain't coming here. I've already stood out in the water before and defied it and told it not to show up. And had I stood there any longer, it would have over, come over the top of my head. Everybody with me? Amen. So sometimes you just got to walk through it. You got to like figure out what you're going to learn through this thing. But they have this thing in common. And because of that, the hurricane had us all wrapped up in anxiety. You know, anxiety is fear of what's the future. What, what you can't see could happen, that threat. Don't be afraid of a day that is never seen. When it was over with, I kind of got mad at myself. I said, Self, why did you get all worked up over this thing? Amen. You could have changed it if it happened. All you can do is prepare for it and do the best you can. Same way in life. Our worst imaginations almost never happen. And most worries die in vain anticipation. Fear keeps you running from something that isn't after you. Mm-hmm. Never be afraid to trust an unknown future to an unknown God. Fear brings threats. Threats lock you out of your future. Amen. Threats confine, confine you from, your, from expanding. They intimidate you out of your purpose. They keep you from the God connections in your life. Threats will limit you and keep you from taking risks. Threats will shut you out of the promises of God. Threats cause you to develop a siege mentality, overly fearful attitude. One of the things I've not done, I've not overstocked, I've not built a shelter, I've not gone through, and I'm not, if you got it, I ain't talking about you, I don't know about you, so you're still, you're, you're still good. I'm just telling you that fear will cause you to do some crazy things in life. The enemy recognizes confidence. The enemy sees it. When you're confident. David said to the Philistine, you come against me with a sword and a spear and a javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day, the Lord will hand you over to me. I'll strike you down. I'll cut off your head. Today, I will give the carcasses of the Philistine army to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field, and the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. All those gathered here will know that it is not by sword or spear that the Lord saves, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give all, all, the, all of you into our hands. Now let me back up and tell you what David's saying here. First he's saying that I've been chosen. I'm anointed. I know God is for me. I'm a little more spiritual than you think. I ain't here to fight you in my own strength. My own strength, I can't fight you. You're ten and a half foot tall. I'm a little red-headed, freckle-faced boy with a sling and, a, and five stones because I see you got four brothers. And if I take you down, I may have to take your brothers. How many know sometimes you take one family member, you got to take them all on? Amen. David understood that. But he said, the truth about it is, Goliath, I am here in the name of the Lord. I know who God is. I've prayed to God. And this is what God told me. He told me to get a plan. My plan is to take your head from your shoulders. Everybody hear me? As you're going through life, you've got to get a plan. If you're going to do anything in life, get your plan together. Figure out what it is you're going to do. Pray. Ask God. He walked out there with such confidence. Everybody say confidence. He didn't just walk. The scripture says he ran to the battle. He ran after Goliath. Most of us would come. We'd be running from rock to rock. He ran toward the battle with his slinging stone. Goliath had an armor bearer in front of him that was probably bigger than David. And David took the stone, hit him upside the head with it, brought him to the ground. I've preached this a thousand times. But in my mind, I never quite understood the confidence that David had. He wasn't cocky. He wasn't arrogant. He was confident that if I killed a lion and I killed a bear. But let me tell you, I come at this thing in the name of the Lord. As you do things in this life, I want you to pray about it. I want you to get a plan. I want you to ask God, what I'm fixing to say, and this bothers me. This is why a lot of social stuff I stay away from. It don't matter what you say on there. Somebody's got to complain against it. They see another. So it, it kind of shuts us up. It makes us quiet. Therefore, I just use a lot of scripture. You want to come against God? Help yourself. Amen. But I'm going, to come, I'm going to come against this thing in the name of the Lord. 
I'm going to believe God for the best as I move forward. David, David lived by a very simple principle. Nothing to prove here, nothing to lose. David's eyes weren't on Goliath. I got to get my eyes off of this virus, off of the foolishness that I see in the world, off of the hurt that people are going through. Amen. Uh, no matter what it is, I got to get my eyes off that. I got to get my eyes off the politics that are fixing to take place. Amen. I, I, I have, I, you know, my politics have not changed in 40 years. If you are for the unborn, I am for you. That's it. That's it. It's that simple. I don't look at economy. I don't look at who can bless petroleum more or who can bless uh, 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 this racial group more. I look at who is for the babies. And if you're for the unborn, it's that simple. I, my friend, I would vote for Joe Biden if he stood up and said, no more abortion. That's it. I don't have a problem with that. Pastor, now pastor. I don't mean anything. Well, you got to vote. For, most of you didn't vote for Trump last time. You voted against Hillary. <laughs> Quit lying to yourself. You didn't know what that man going to turn out to be like. You know, so we fight, fight these things, but we got to get our eyes off of the giants in front of us and get our eyes on God. Amen. My strength is, comes from Him. My anointing comes from Him. Much as I love you, you can't anoint me. You put oil on me, but you can't make it anoint me. You can't give me the power to withstand. It's God that did that. It's God that does that. The lessons to remember. First, facing giants is an intimidating experience. You will face a Goliath that I have never faced. I will face giants you will never face. Sometimes people will go to others for counsel. Unless I've been through what you've been through, I can't probably, I, I, I pray for you, but I probably can't help you. I can help you, sir. I've been through it. I can help Pastor Kenneth. I've been through it. Who did Kenneth call when he went through the storm? Somebody been through the storm. Amen. This is important in life as you move through it. So first, facing giants is an intimidating experience, but the anointing breaks the yoke. Second, doing battle is a lonely experience. No one can fight for you. Your Goliath is your Goliath. Your pastor, your friend, your family, your spouse, they can encourage you what you've got to do to fight him. And it's during the lonely times that you learn to trust God. It's knowing that you did take out a lion and a bear. That you fasted and prayed. And things begin to break. You put yourself in a rehab. I'm not talking about going somewhere. You put yourself personally in a rehab. And you said, you, you're going to get yourself together. Amen. You're going to get yourself right. You're going to have to quit these addictions that are destroying your body. You need more time here. You know what gives you the most motivation I found in life? They call grandkids. They'll motivate you. I don't care how, how healthy you think you are. You ain't healthy enough to outrun a five-year-old grandchild. So you got to start working to get yourself right. Trusting God is a stabilizing experience. David needed just one stone to fly straight. His aim was true. It's amazing how stable we become when we spend time with God. When David reached down into that brook, the scripture says he sought for a stone that was smooth. Jagged rock won't fly straight, but he hunted for the smooth stone. David was, you know, they say practice makes perfect. It doesn't if you practice it wrong. But if you practice right, and David, he wasn't hurling gnarly stones. He found a smooth stone. And he picked it up and said, this one stone, I can take him out. Winning victories is a memorial experience. It is the memories of past victories that gives us confidence in our future. The fact that we've come through two major hurricanes in three years gives us confidence. We've had financial struggles in the midst of building and expanding. Struggles I never told you about, but we overcame them. God showed up, blessed us, and helped us. We have confidence. Amen. It gives us confidence over intimidation. You have fought battles. You have fought battles. Some of you have come through a drug and alcohol addiction. You know what it's like. Amen. You know what it's like and what it did in your life. I, I, I am not, a bo I'm not boastful about it. I haven't had a drink in 40 years. But there are times, oh my goodness, 
I think about what it would be like not to just drink. Who just drinks to get drunk again? And then I go through the ramifications. You know what they are? My grandfather shooting and killing my uncle. My dad losing his mind at times. Uh, I go through and I get thinking about the funerals I've done. The young man, one of the young men that led me to Christ, his name was Bubba. Married a young girl named Vicky in Bible college. Had a little daughter. She was four or five years old. Both of them hit and killed by a drunk driver. Both of them laid in the same coffin together. Those are the things that run through my mind. So if you can think about what the giants can do to you, then all of a sudden you begin to shift and realize, you know what? I have confidence I can overcome this. It gives us His power, love, and a sound mind, not a spirit of fear. I close with this. Why hold on to your confidence? Hebrews 10, 35. Do not throw away your confidence. It will be richly rewarded. 1 John 5, 14. And this is the confidence that we have in Him. That if we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. Confidence produces the reward. A reward. But without faith it is impossible to please Him. For he that cometh must believe that He is and that He is a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. A rewarder is a, a remunerator. Amen. Which means to give for services rendered. Still blows my mind. Why God would want to give me a reward for being blessed by Him. Everything I got came from Him. The air I breathe, the life I live, the church we have, amen, the kids I got, everything you got came from God. And God said, listen, and I'm going to put a reward on top of that. I'm going to bless you on top of that. It blesses me to hear that, man. Amen, to know that. Philippians 1, 6 says, being confident. Everybody say confident. Of this very thing, that he which began a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. God has never stopped working in your life. Look around you and see it. He never stopped planting. He's still working in your life. Being confident of this. So if you look in the mirror and you say to yourself, I don't think God's done yet. Then understand this. He's not. He's not. He, doesn't, he won't even give you a, an ending date. He doesn't even tell you, okay, you know, 2021, you're going to be complete. No. If he did that to you, you'd get arrogant. He takes that thing all the way up to your old death date. He said, I'm going to work on you, so be confident of this, this very thing, that I began a good work. This causes me to stand back and tell you this. I have seen people that some people have already given up on. But I saw God start a work in their life. Your children, my children, family members, God started a work in their life. And when God started a work in their life, I stand back and say, well, Pastor, you don't understand. They backslid. They shrinking back. They have the fear. I know. I know. I know. But I have this confidence that God started a good work in their life. Amen. And it ain't about me that God is not. He's got them under surveillance. He's watching them. There was an anointing. They, they came to kids camp, youth camp. God did something in their life. And I ain't backing away to tell you that it's over yet. I see God doing a work in their life. And even if I'm dead and gone, I'm believing God to do his thing in their life. Can I get a big praise in this house? God, I pray for every connection to this building, every connection to this house. You started a good work in them. They have faced Goliath. They faced intimidation. Yes, some have shrunk back. Some have shrunk back from this, uh, this virus. Some have shrunk back from the protests. And riots. Some have shrunk back. They don't know which way to go. God, they, uh, you know, what, what do we do with this thing that's taking place in America right now and the world? You started a good work in them. And you're going to complete it. I have confidence you're going to complete it. I have a hope you're going to complete it. It's the only hope I got right now, God, is in you. Our Goliaths are too big for us to fight on our own. We need your anointing. We need your unction. Come on, put your hands in the air. We need your unction, God. I want you to touch us, God, today. Give us an unction to overcome. Shut our arrogant mouths. God, if we don't have the answer, help us quit being smart, Alex, and trying to just say something. Give us words of life to speak into death. God, we speak life into death. 
God, love into hate, peace into chaos. Anoint these earthen vessels with the power of God. And whatever Goliath's fall in our midst, it was you that done it. It was you that gets the glory. In Jesus' name. Amen, amen, amen. Hallelujah. Amen. There's a tithe and offering envelope. Those watching online, we thank you for your faithfulness and giving. Many of those online now have really started stepping up and helping us out financially. Also, you can take, if you're uh, over and above your tithe now, I want you to give an offering toward the hurricane. I want you to help us out. We went yesterday and spent, I think, $1,800, $1,800. I, I can't wait on things. I got to make sure this gets happening. Amen. I, I think about the air condition I stayed in last night. Until you have spent a night after a hurricane with no, no electricity. You know, I know we're not pioneers of the old. We soft. We soft. We like soft bed, soft chair, good food. Amen. I ate more canned goods after that hurricane. You, you, you just eat what you got, you know. So it's important. You know, I might even might grab a bar, big barbecue pit and haul it to Louisiana for it. So from feed them some barbecue. I, I don't know how this thing will turn out. But over the next couple of weeks, my hope is to render aid and help toward our friends. I'm not trying to in any way manipulate you. You don't have to feel any compulsion. I'm just telling you, Kenneth Smith is my friend. He's your friend. Amen. He loves this church. You already know that. He's come to preach our 17th conference. He didn't ask for this. Amen. But it's upon him. So we want to help him and his family. Again, thank you for your faithfulness in giving. Tuesday night, I am requesting you to be here. Uh, Eddie is a uh, matter of fact, I've known of Eddie for many, many years. So I haven't had a chance to get him in. And so it just worked out that we could get it. A lot of evangelists aren't getting into churches at all right now. Maybe a lot of churches aren't having church. Some are hush hush pushing people back i want to see a blessing this week amen for a man who does a lot of work in prison ministry you know i told you know i was in jail for uh i had a 60-day sentence for protesting against the death of the unborn and uh i remember preaching every night while i was in jail 21 out of 22 nights i remember getting to preach and they they would bring preachers in to preach and I would go oh my God Until, you know there's something about somebody that's been there already and can talk to you you know it was easy for me to talk to the prisoners because I was a prisoner but if you self righteous I got on to one preacher coming in and act like he's all that because he'd never been to jail I pointed him back toward the jail cell door you don't need to be in here because he fall. I, I shut him down I wouldn't even let our folk listen to him I said this guy's full of self righteousness and arrogance Amen. Ain't got no business listening to you. Told the guards that. Don't let that preacher back in here. Amen. I don't even know if he knows G. I, I was mad. I was upset. So I like to know when a man who's been in prison goes back into prison and reaches out to folk. Eddie's one of those guys. Amen. So we want to hear him on Tuesday night and Wednesday night. Either night if you can make it or both. Amen. David, if you'd come on up. We got some announcements again. Uh, be here for Eddie. Um, that will be our first week midweek. Uh, now till uh, Muscle Car Sunday, fun, uh, kids fundraiser, Coke donations. Donate all kinds of Cokes for the kids to sell during Muscle Car. All proceeds go toward getting kids to kids camp. See Marley and uh, Randa for details. So in the back, Miss Randa will be back there. Um, again. September 6th, there'll be baby dedication. September 6th, there'll be clothing ministry will be open. And uh, Tayden's Pantry will be open. On September 13th, uh, baptisms. And September 13th, uh, swap seniors with a purpose Bible study after service at 10 a.m. See the riches for details. If you guys, is there anything you guys are doing special this time? Okay, come on. They said they're going to start studying Thessalonians. Awesome. So um, come be in part, hang out with them. Let's learn together. You know, it's one thing to just hang out, but it's another thing to grow. 
spiritually together. It's very important. September 20th, uh, Lift Ladies Bible Study after service in the Fellowship Hall. See Ms. Diane Phelan. Uh, September 27th, TLCC, ki the kitchen crew needs cookies and brownies and single serve baggies for Muscle Car Sunday. Sign ups are in the back of the church. Um, see Miss Judy Declan or um, just sign up in the back and she'll get a hold of you guys. Oh, let's see. No, that's good. Right. Okay, cookies and brownies, and the reason is if you put a cupcake in a bag, doesn't look very cupcakey. No. Just looks like a smeared mess. Okay, put a piece of cake in a bag. It's pretty messy. So that's why they're asking for things that aren't going to look real nasty so that we still look like we have excellence when we're giving out a bag, right? right. <laughs> Give somebody a bag of smushed up cake. Thanks. Uh, so again, cookies and brownies for uh, for that if you guys are going to help out in, in that. Um, see, September 27th will be Muscle Car Sunday. It's going to be on Stay In Your Lane. It's going to be 11 a.m. service this year, and it's going to be at the New Caney campus. If you guys haven't been to one, I strongly suggest coming, especially from this side. I know a lot of people are like, well, that's all the way in New Caney. Make it out. Even if you can't serve in any capacity, just come. See what happens. This is this is one of the biggest outreaches our church does all year, and it's fantastic. It really reaches out to people that normally wouldn't make it to church. And it's a way for us to just be able to love on people so that they recognize, man, these people ain't just about being holy rollers or any of that. They're, they genuinely want to see people come to the kingdom in a loving manner. And, and we're not self-righteous, like Pastor said. We're not trying to be self-righteous. We just want people to show up to the house and find that God is good. Amen. October 4th through the 7th is going to be the fall conference overcoming um, 2020. How many know we need to overcome, especially in today's day and age? And again, pastor said you'll never be an overcomer until you have something to overcome. And 2020 has given us plenty to overcome. Amen. So today, as we give, we're believing for jobs and better jobs. More money, less hours. Benefits, sales and commission, checks in the mail, gifts and surprises, finding money, bills paid off, settlements, inheritance, rebates and returns, debts demolished, royalties received, favor and success to the kingdom. Thank you, Lord. We're going to pray and we'll get up out of here. Please pick up your kids.